Okay, so this is chapter three, macromolecules, and this is part two of the video review. So we'll be looking at proteins specifically. Now, in general, when we talk about these macromolecules, remember I want you to know what they're made of, how they're linked together, okay, and how they function inside the cells. So, so keep that in mind as we go through the macromolecules for proteins. All right. So proteins, let's take a look. Proteins are made out of building blocks, or their monomer are, are called amino acids, sometimes abbreviated two capital A's. Uh, there's only 20 amino acids to choose from, and they come together in different arrangements to make all the hundreds of thousands of proteins in uh, living organisms. And these amino acids can come together, you can have two of them, two, or four, or five, or ten to make a protein, or you can have thousands of them to make a protein. Right? Now we've got to link them together to make these large molecules. That, remember, we're talking about macromolecules, so these are large molecules. Here's the protein. Here's an example. They're all linked together by a special bond. It's a covalent bond, so they're strong, and it's called a peptide bond. So each of these bonds is a, called a peptide bond. Each of these structures shown here on this slide are amino acids. So here's one, linked to another one, linked to another one. If you look at them, they're all a little bit different. You know, Some of them are the same, some of them are different. And that's the amino acids. There's only 20 to choose from. And what makes one protein unique from another is the order of these proteins and the number of them. Okay. Now remember, each of these amino acids are unique based on this side group attached to them. And we'll take a look at some amino acids in a second. Why are proteins so important? Well, in, in general, they can almost be considered the workhorse of cells. Okay, they're very, very important. They have uh, the one thing right off the bat, proteins, most enzymes are proteins. Enzymes are the structures or the uh, molecules that carry out a chemical reaction without being used up themselves. Um, but that's not all proteins do. Some proteins provide structural support. They can provide so like a cytoskeleton inside our cells, provide support at the cellular level, protection, so clotting factors, they're made of proteins, transport example of transportation protein hemoglobin this is a protein that carries oxygen in our blood very important and catalysis this just means carrying out chemical reactions defense antibodies these are structures that are proteins okay regulation of important cell processes like cell division gene regulation when genes are used not used movement our muscles are mostly protein and they offer our movement so proteins are so important that our genes all 20,000 of them um, encode the information to make proteins. So when we say our cells have the blueprint to make new cells, those genes as the blueprint, the genes actually encode the information just to make proteins. So that's how important proteins are. So once you have the proteins, then you can make everything else the cell needs. Let's look at these building blocks of proteins. We call them amino acids. So here's a picture of a generalized kind of generic amino acid. These are the basic features that you need to know. There's a center carbon called an alpha carbon. Then on the right, in this illustration, there's the carboxyl group. And then on the left, there's the amino group. So we just learned about functional groups in the first installment of chapter three review, the introduction. Now we're using them already. So here's a carboxyl group, here's the amino group. You put that together, amino acid. Amino acid, that's a carboxylic acid. So amino group, carboxyl group. Now how do you get 20 different amino acids? They all have the amino group, they all have a central carbon, they all have a carboxyl group, they all have a hydrogen. What changes between all 20 is this side chain. Okay, and this gives each amino acid a unique chemical property. What are these chemical properties? Well, some amino acids are charged, and that makes them hydrophilic. You know, if they have a charge, water has partial charges, like things, like like things, so charged hydrophilic amino acids are going to like water. Some are polar, but they don't have charges. Okay, so these guys also like water. And then another group of the amino acids are nonpolar, hydrophobic. They do not like water. And this gives that portion of the protein very important properties, we'll see later. Here's an example of the 20 amino acids grouped into their um, subgroups that I just talked about. You don't need to memorize these, but it's a visual representation of what I'm talking about. Each of these are the amino acids. They have a hydroxyl uh, carboxylic group, they have the amino group, okay? And then they have a side chain that makes each one unique, okay? 
these side chains here are electrically charged. If you zoom in, it's kind of hard to see. There's a plus sign here, a plus sign here, okay, negative and negative. They give them charges. So they, they uh, can interact with water. They're uh, electrically charged. Here's a polar amino acids. These uh, are polar. They can dissolve in water. These guys are nonpolar. If you look, there's no charges. It's mostly just hydrogen and carbon, and that makes them hydrophobic. Okay, so you can see there's only 20 to choose from, and however you link these together in different arrangements, you get the different proteins. Um, now, you don't have to memorize all the amino acids, but one amino acid that's unique, um, and there's actually two that have sulfur, but cysteine has sulfur in its side group. So here's the central carbon, here's the amino group, here's a carboxylic acid group, and cysteine, this amino acid cysteine, has an SH. We just learned about SH. This is a functional group we talked about called the sulfhydryl group. So it's, these functional groups are important. It's going to give this portion of the protein a unique property. So what happens if you have an amino acid in a protein right here, that's cysteine, and either this protein folds over on itself or there's another protein beside it that also has a cysteine, these two cysteines are going to interact with each other. They're going to actually form a covalent bond between their sulfurs. So here's the cysteine, here's the cysteine. They link together and they form a bridge. You can literally see that. It's called a disulfide bridge. What that's going to do is it's going to hold these two regions of this protein together, or if these are two separate proteins, hold them together. Okay, this is very important because it's a strong linkage, linking these together. If you remember in class, I talked about antibodies, these uh, portions of your immune system that are made out of protein and they're held together, an individual um, antibody is formed, in part, it has a disulfide bridge that helps link it together. Okay, so when we're talking about joining amino acids together to make a actual protein, we have to do a condensation or dehydration reaction. We're synthesizing something. So when we link one amino acid to another one, we lose a water. So water's lost. That's a condensation or dehydration reaction. We're making something. That's synthesis. Now these two amino acids are linked together by a peptide bond. That's a covalent bond. And the, it's specific for protein. It's called a peptide. Each of these are called peptides. So a peptide bond links them together. Real quick, remember, for each of the macromolecules, you want to know how they're held together. So how are proteins held together? Peptide bonds. It's a covalent bond. It's a strong bond. All right. Now once we get the full chain of amino acids linked together, it's called a polypeptide. Many peptides linked together by peptide bonds. And it forms the a mature adult form of that protein. So here's a protein. It's a long chain, but you might notice it's actually wrapped up on itself. It's not s straight or linear. So it has a unique structure. And remember, structure and function so important. We're seeing in this amino acid, or this protein, it has a unique structure. It gives it a function. In this case, hemoglobin carries oxygen, and it's based on its structure and its components. All right. One of the most important properties of proteins that we'll learn about is that they have a three-dimensional st structure that gives them their function. And there's four levels of structure related to proteins. I'm going to go over them right now, kind of briefly uh, refer you to the slides to make sure you understand all the details, but I want to give a brief overview in a, in a reasonable amount of time. So let's look at that first level of structure, primary. That means first. Primary structure is essentially just the amino acid sequence. Okay. And we'll see one amino acid, another one, another one, all linked together by peptide bonds. Sometimes this is referred to as a um, beads on a string. It's just l l uh, held together by their peptide bond. Okay. The next level of organization here is called secondary structure. Secondary structure is, there's two types, alpha helix, which is a twist, a spiral, and pleated sheets, or beta pleated sheets. What you need to know about these secondary structures is that there's two alpha helixes and beta sheets, and that these shapes, you take that long chain of amino acids, and now they twist up into a helix because of hydrogen bonds between the amino acids, or they form a pleated sheet because of hydrogen bonds between the amino acids. Okay, so that's how these form. So secondary structures are formed because of hydrogen bonds between the amino acids. Right, right here, repeat that. Hydrogen uh, secondary structures are formed by hydrogen bonds between amino acids. There's two types, alpha helix, beta sheets. Now the third level is called the tertiary structure, and this is once you've taken all those 
amino acids, you've already twisted them into helices or beta sheets. Now that secondary level, now the third level is you take those sheets and those helices and the straight regions and you form a more complex 3D structure. You get this by using lots of interactions between all the amino acids. We can have covalent linkage. So here's disulfide bridge that's causing it to form this kind of big U-shape and hold it in place very strongly with the covalent bond. There's ionic interactions right here based on charges. There's hydrogen bonding. We see right here when you see a dotted line as hydrogen bonding. Um, there's hydrophobic interactions, van der Waal forces. So all those bonds we learned about in the um, previous chapter, they come to, they all are used to make the three-dimensional shape of a protein. Remember, the structure is going to be important. So if you change the amino acids, then this might no longer have a disulfide bridge. If you change this amino acid, you might not be able to form a hydrogen bond here. You would lose this shape, and the protein wouldn't function properly. The highest level, then, of protein structure is called quaternary structure. This is the fourth level, and this results when you get an individual protein or a peptide here, polypeptide, that's already gone through secondary folding. It's gone through tertiary to give us this kind of triangle shape overall. And then the quaternary is when we take several peptides, polypeptides, and link them together to create a protein. So there's this intact entire protein here is made out of four subunits. Each subunit is an individual polypeptide that's been processed in those foldings that we talked about. This slide here just emphasizes that to get the tertiary structure of any single protein, polypeptide, and to cause these subunits to link with other subunits, we have to rely on all these interactions again, ionic interactions, hydrophobic interactions, and hydrogen bonding. All right, so I kind of quickly went through those levels of organization. I can't emphasize them enough, how important they are. So you go back a few slides, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. Know these, know the definition of them, know examples, so uh, secondary, alpha helix, beta sheets. Also know the types of bonds that give us each of the level of folding. So secondary bonds are just hydrogen, or secondary structures, just hydrogen bonds. Tertiary, we're using all those bonds we talked about. Okay, so make sure you review that. I uh, refer you to the notes, PowerPoint slides, and your class um, notes. Okay, the last thing I want to mention is we, we take all this time to make a protein, have its three-dimensional shape that gives it its function, but these proteins can lose their shape, and when that happens, they denature. So denaturing a protein means losing its shape. Biggest things that do this are high temperature. Okay, so if you heat up a protein, it denatures. Think about an egg, put it in a skillet. Egg has a lot of protein in it. When you heat it up, it denatures, and you can see it, it changes shape, or it changes color, right? Sometimes when our proteins denature, if you put the temperature back down, they'll renature or they'll reform their 3D shape. But sometimes denature completely uh, causes them to lose their shape. Um, okay, so that is the protein section of Chapter 3, just a brief overview. Um, and we'll have a couple more installments of the Chapter 3. Okay.